we've really asked these three speakers to, to reflect on some of the challenges and demands of Indigenous studies more broadly. Um, we've already had some questions raised and chewed over um, throughout the day, the question of ep epistemic specificity versus transnational or trans indigenous models, for instance, limitations of categories like indigeneity, which is a, a kind of presiding question for everybody who has any encounter with the field, I think. Um, but we asked our speakers to, to um, think around two particular questions. The first of which is what for you are the questions that Indigenous studies urgently needs to tackle now? Um, and the second, how might scholars working in the UK or Europe both negotiate the ethical imperatives of Indigenous and settler colonial studies and uh, I guess most, most usefully contribute to, the, uh, to, to addressing those challenges? So each of the three speakers is going to speak um, uh, largely around question one, but the conversation that will follow from that hopefully will we'll, um, push towards uh, some answers to question two as well. So just to introduce our three speakers in the order in which they'll speak. Um, Jody Bird is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma and Associate Professor of English and Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she's also a faculty affiliate at the National Center for Supercom Supercomputing Applications. I feel there's a conversation for you to have with uh, Jody there, Michael. Um, she's the author of Transit of Empire, Indigenous Critiques of Colonialism, and her work on critical Indigenous studies, queer Indigenous studies, and critical technology studies has appeared most recently in Critical Ethnic Studies, Settler Colonial Studies, Social Text, and South Atlantic Quarterly, as well as in Joanne Barker's edited collection, Critically Sovereign, Indigenous Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies. Um, so then we'll have Cole Thrush who's a historian of place, looking at the intersections between indigenous histories and the histories of settler colonialism. His first book, Native Seattle, Histories from the Crossing Over Place, examined the links between urban and indigenous histories in the Northwest's largest city. While his most recent book, Indigenous London, Native Travellers at the Heart of Empire, reframes the history of the British Empire's capital through the experiences of indigenous children, women and men who journeyed there willingly or otherwise. He's also written about ghosts, earthquakes and tsunamis and food. And his current projects um, include a critical cultural and environmental history of shipwrecks and settler colonialism on the northwest coast, entitled Wrecked, Ecologies of Failure in the Graveyard of the Pacific. And then Chris Anderson um, is a professor and the Dean of the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. He's um, the former director of the Rupert's Land Centre for Métis Research and additionally serves as the interim institutional co-lead of Indigenous Initiatives for the University of Alberta from February 2018 to August 2019. Dr. Anderson is the author of two books with Maggie Walter, Indigenous Statistics, a Quantitative Indigenous Methodology and um, Métis Race Recognition and the Struggle for Indigenous Peoplehood. In 2015, the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association awarded Métis the 2014 prize for best subsequent book uh, in Native American and Indigenous Studies. And in 20, 2016, it was shortlisted for the 2015 Canada Prize. With Gene O'Brien, he also co-edited the recently published Sources and Methods in Indigenous Studies. Okay, so I'm gonna hand over to Jody first. All right, I wanted to make sure my video is working um, and everything's back online. Um, the comments I have for today, just to get us started, I wanted to keep fairly free form to get the conversation moving. Um, and so I um, wanted to take up the, the, couple, the questions, at least the first one in this um, first, the first question that was posed about what are the most pressing issues for indigenous studies. The second question around what does it mean to do indigenous studies in the European context, I think is a one that's slightly harder for me to, to really conceptualize given that my my work is grounded primarily in um, North America and um, potentially um, in, in um, the, the Americas and the global south, but that's a, that's a large claim that I don't necessarily want to make for myself um, in this context. Um, you know, in breaking it down, I think um, one of the things um, in, in just um, immediately that came to mind is the ways in which the U.S. colonial presence 
um, at least in the ways that it's shaping how we understand indigenous studies and settler colonial studies in North America, um, kind of forecloses or anticipates perhaps, or um, anticipates Anglophone um, settler colonialism as the thing that we've emphasized the most. As a, as a son of the Chickasaw, um, however, um, we've had experiences um, throughout, time, uh, throughout um, in con contact with Europeans from the Spanish and the French, um, the French even more so than the Spanish with the Soto, um, we always like to joke about with, with other Southeastern tribes who actually was responsible for, for stopping DeSoto's advance up the Mississippi. And then of course the Chickasaws were the ones who did that. Um, so I, I sort of hold the, the, you, the, you know, the implications for doing indigenous studies in European context is it has to be sort of understood as a kind of counterpoint to the US colonial present, what Alyosha names, um, Alyosha Goldstein names for us um, as, an, as a, a way of thinking about what some of us refer to as ongoing settler colonialism um, in, 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 on the continental um, um, United States. Um, so that's the first sort of thought that I had and wanted to, to vote for us. My second one, and this one sort of is, is um, maybe um, uh, getting towards some of the things around terminologies and, and methodologies and, and potentially even ontological questions. And that is something that has been, I, I've been teaching classes in settler colonial studies. And one of the things I try to drive home with my students in that is that settler colonial studies is not indigenous studies. Sometimes the two get conflated um, and um, circulate as, uh, and, as, um, as similar um, projects, and, and they are. But I think the emphasis um, and, and, the, and the focus um, with indigenous studies is of course on understanding indigenous um, philosophies, indigenous strategies for survival and resistance, where I think settler colonial studies focuses um, primarily on structures of violence um, and, um, and um, conceptions of um, power um, within the legacies of conquest. Um, for me, what drives home, I think the difference um, can be maybe even seen in like the first couple of sentences from Patrick Wolf's um, essay, elimination of the native, the thing that everyone always cites for how settler colonialism destroys to replace. But the first uh, couple of sentences for me um, kind of capture it, which is, he starts, the question of genocide is never far from discussions of settler colonialism. Land is life, or at least land is necessary for life. Thus, contests for land can be, indeed often are, contests for life. And what I wanted to, what I flagged for my students and what I want to flag here is that um, Patrick Wolf can, puts a conditional on land is life. Within indigenous philosophies, that's actually literal. Land is alive, right? Land is um, spirit. Land has presence. Land has um, governance structures. Land, um, uh, water, water, all of these things orient us into a world of um, human, non-human that determine um, what, the, what the structures of governance and relationality would be. For Patrick Wolf, that idea of land is life is conditional and to, to the have to say that land is necessary for life. Um, and that is actually what the stake for what contests of land actually are when, when indigenous and settler colonial societies struggle over these things. That leads me to my next um, point that I want to say is the most pressing issue. And I say this having spent my summer in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, and um, seeing the degrees to which both um, indigenous um, presence and um, um, it, it, and awareness of stolen land is a part of the conversation within the uh, uprisings and protests that have happened um, in the wake of George Floyd's murder by police. Um, I think we see this concept of BIPOC, um, Black Indigenous People of Color, becoming a phrase that is used, at least in North America, to capture the um, particularities for and, and singularities of experience within that. And I think it's, it's a definite call, an explicit call, for um, both indigenous studies and settler colonial studies to deal with anti-blackness and the um, legacies of slavery. And this last one is one that's um, vital for the Chickasaws to engage, especially as we are looking at um, you know, freedmen um, in both the Chickasaw and Choctaw nations calling for accountability for citizenship rights um, to, to uh, ask our communities and nations to deal with our investment in anti-blackness and the ways in which our um, structures of governance are hinged upon our participation in slavery. So I think the work that we have to do within indigenous studies is really understand what we, um, how anti-blackness is actually informing how we theorize sovereignty, how we theorize um, territoriality, how we, how we theorize some of these ontological questions. 
Um, and the final thing that I wanted to flag as important for the conversations to me in this most pressing issues is how gender and sexuality um, are theorized or not within the field of indigenous studies. I think we're still, we're seeing, you know, within protest um, movements, uprising continued, like historically and in the present, um, trans, um, queer, two-spirit um, activists have been at the forefront of articulating resistances. And yet I think indigenous studies in the academy is still struggling with how to address these um, questions. And I think indigenous feminists um, and indigenous queer scholars and two-spirit scholars are starting to give us frameworks. Um, and I think it's, um, you know, as we start to see more and more attention be given to um, issues like missing and murdered indigenous women in Canada and the United States, the ways that, you know, even um, our current president Trump here in the United States um, and Melania Trump have, have politicized and used um, missing and murdered indigenous women in, in Minnesota this summer as a way to signal investments in you know, indigenous populations over um, potentially engaging um, black life and black lives matter. Um, I think there's, I, there's so much work to be done about what it means to understand indigenous women as political orders, as Audra Simpson tells us, or Leanne Simpson tells us, and what violence against indigenous women are uh, as doing within settler colonial structures. And um, I think at that, I, this is where I want to stop so we can get to other, uh, to call and, and to Chris, and then um, open it up for questions and conversations. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jodie. There's, there's a, an awful lot to think about there. Um, so if we move straight to Cole, and we will uh, undoubtedly come back to, to talk further about some of this. Okay, uh, great. It's an honor to be on this panel for sure. So um, I, um, to begin, uh, you know, I'm coming to you from the ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations here in Vancouver. And I'm just a few blocks from the ancestral community of Sinauk. And I, I start here with a really simple land acknowledgement because my scholarship's been primarily interested in questions of place, belonging, and unbelonging, whether in Seattle and on the Northwest Coast or in, in London and more broadly across Britain. And obviously there are critiques to be made of land acknowledgements, um, questions about their efficacy as a, anything other than performance really. And I, But I'd like to come back to the question of land acknowledgements before I end today. Um, but first, I'd like to just suggest some potential directions and challenges for Indigenous history and Indigenous studies in European contexts, um, and then maybe focus more on the ethical questions in our discussion, after all three of us have spoken. And I'm speaking here really as a, a settler historian who's been learning from Indigenous studies for the past decade or so, um, and really trying to think about the um, the responsibilities of my discipline as a, as a historian um, to this larger conversation and this much more, I would say, much more vital conversation that's happening in Indigenous studies. So I thought I'd, I'd throw out just a couple of ideas about um, possible directions for research and writing. Um, one, perhaps not surprisingly, is, is the notion of Indigenous people and people's, quote, out of place. Um, to use uh, Phil Deloria's framing, which we all know, um, Indians in unexpected places. And one of the origins of indigenous history as a field has been in place-based land claims research. And while that's been really important, it's contributed in some ways to the notion that indigenous peoples and peoples, or at least indigeneity, are somehow spatially bounded or somehow smaller um, than other histories. At the same time, we know that um, both diasporic and carceral forms of estrangement from modernity, um, things like urbanity or technology, has been absolutely central to the narrative structures that undergird settler colonialism. And so it makes sense for scholars working in European contexts to examine the histories of indigenous people who came willingly or otherwise to places such as London or Madrid or Paris and Copenhagen. These sorts of histories have the potential to bring global and imperial histories into conversations um, with indigenous history in new ways, um, showing how indigeneity and coloniality are at times mutually constitutive beyond the metaphors of civilization and savagery and beyond notions that indigenous histories are small, fugitive and place bound while imperial histories are big, certain and expansive. And it's in the stories of indigenous travelers and those who came to Europe to stay um, that we can see the lived lineaments of both empire and survivance. 
But I want to expand the frame slightly and think about a, an additional related area of research that has to do with really the material and entanglements of European and indigenous spaces. And here I'm thinking about objects, cultural belongings, tanga um, as travelers and the non-human as travelers. And, and just from my work in, in Britain, I can think about the ways in which um, tobacco uh, transformed British society. Um, I'm thinking about a, a building in Soho that was constructed out of capital, built out of the fur trade and indigenous labor. Um, I'm thinking about a, a country house that I've been doing some consulting at, um, where the library is full of books about North America. The house was built during King Philip's War. Um, it was owned by a colonial administrator. The stairs in that house are built out of American walnut, and the very grain of that wood is the result of indigenous knowledge practices and land practices and ontologies. So how do we do that kind of work that shows the ways in which materially European landscapes are actually inflected by indigeneity, indigenous systems of knowledge and material practices and so on. And I think that these approaches really have the potential to capsize what uh, Linda Tuhiwai Smith has famously called the origin stories of empire. Um, and to use her words, this is kind of a rereading of stories that have become so normative um, uh, more broadly. And then I have a, a couple of thoughts um, for historians specifically, um, and, and particularly white historians. Um, our discipline has been really slow, I would say, to take up the approaches of indigenous studies and to, to engage with that field um, and to really participate in the conversation. We can think about, for example, why are there so few indigenous PhDs in history? And I think we need to really come to terms with the fact that our discipline has been one of the primary technologies of empire, at least in terms of narrative technologies, um, and to really come to terms with the legacy of that in our discipline. And I, I raise that because I'm, I'm concerned that there's a bit of a backlash that's, that's developing right now against engagements with indigenous studies. I think about a recent forum in the American Historical Review, um, which took to task the uh, Native American and Indigenous Studies Association and other, um, other sort of approaches that try to bring indigenous history and indigenous studies together. And a recent forum, a plenary forum, um, for another historical organization that ended up, essentially ended up being an apologia for Andrew Jackson. And there seems to be something of a gatekeeping process at work here that is, I feel is becoming a little bit more robust in response to the inroads that have been made between indigenous studies and indigenous history. And in all these cases, no matter what the work we're doing, and, and this is perhaps where some of the backlash is coming from, we need to connect the past with the present. I think historians sometimes operate under the idea that the work we do is with solely the dead. Um, and um, I'm really here drawn to the work of Alyssa Mount Pleasant, Caroline Wigginton, and Kelly Wisecup, who have made an argument in the William and Mary Quarterly that um, even people working in earlier histories need to take up contemporary concerns. And so for you, people working in European context, I think another piece, um, just to bring it to a close here, um, is for um, scholars working in European context to really think about the ways in which indigeneity is being deployed um, and um, appropriated in European contexts and to engage with those issues, whether it's the Exeter chiefs um, and their racist mascot, whether it's the ways in which organizations, you know, sort of right-wing nationalist organizations like the English Defense League have been taking up um, discourses of indigeneity and, and claiming those, or, you know, new age shamans at Stonehenge. We need to really engage with those sorts of appropriations. So to return to the question of territorial acknowledgements, which I see as a metonym for larger questions of relationships between places, between peoples, between scholars and communities, I'd really encourage people working in European context to think about, just as a, as a tool for thinking about this, what would a land acknowledgement look like in your context? And I'm thinking here of a conference that was held in 2017, um, the 400th anniversary of the death of Matuaka or po Pocahontas. Um, the Tonawanda Seneca scholar, um, Shana Goman from UCLA gave a, a land acknowledgement at that conference where she invoked the treaties and wampum, um, wampum some of which lives in 
in Britain. And she invoked that, that transatlantic relationship as a way, as a framing device for thinking about the work we were doing at that conference. And so I would encourage scholars working in European contexts to really think about the ways in which their spaces are materially engaged with these broader histories and to use that as kind of a, a tool for getting into our own accountabilities in European spaces and how we can really expand this field in some dramatic ways. So I'll sort of leave that up to people to think about how they might do that. Um, but I think that's one of the things that we can really be thinking about as again, kind of a metonym for the larger relationships between the fields. So I'll stop there for now and, um, and I look forward to seeing where our conversation goes. Thank you very much, Cole. Um, I'm sure questions are brewing right now. Um, do, do feel free to start putting them in the chat and I'll be keeping an eye on them there. Um, so to Chris. Uh, thanks, David. Um, thank you to everyone who is uh, beaming in for this. I want to uh, apologize a bit right now. Uh, the uh, housing minister, AKA my uh, lovely wife, uh, has uh, set my, my office up in the basement, which doesn't have the best um, internet connection. So hopefully uh, I'll make it through without, um, uh, without too many uh, gaps and silences other than those that are uh, intended. Uh, I want to thank the organizers uh, of the uh, Entangled um, Modernity Symposium and to David in particular for inviting me to speak at this roundtable. Um, I'm uh, Machif, uh, which is an part of an Indigenous people located in what is now for many Western Canada. Uh, I'm originally from the Parkland region of Saskatchewan. For those of you who don't know Canada's geography, uh, my hometown is about a 20 hour drive east of uh, Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. Uh, and although I have a PhD in sociology, my entire professional life has been spent in the Faculty of Native Studies uh, and as such in Indigenous Studies. Um, I don't do a lot of work with settler colonial studies, uh, but as the Dean of uh, one of only two faculties of Indigenous Studies in the world, I feel somewhat qualified to speak to the issues that Indigenous Studies needs to tackle now and how scholars working uh, kind of in the UK, Europe can negotiate the ethical imperatives of Indigenous studies um, specifically. I want to signpost here and I won't talk about it more because it sort of it, it deserves its own kind of broader disciplinary discussion but I think it's important that we differentiate between intellectual uh, and institutional trajectories of Indigenous studies um, because they have enormous impacts on what comes to count as Indigenous studies and they also have enormous impacts on the kinds of uh, collegial wars that go on in the academies between where resources should go and what counts as Indigenous studies in any uh, particular context. And that's not a, a dig at either uh, Jody or Cole, uh, both of uh, whose work we use in our comprehensive exams and are a powerful, powerful part of how we're able to uh, do our work uh, intellectually. But there are, uh, it's really interesting to see that the way that these kinds of things play out, at least in a uh, Canadian context. So uh, regarding the first of David's two questions about what I think should be core to Indigenous studies, I'll mention two points here today. Um, first, it's important to recognize that Indigenous studies, first and foremost, uh, exist to recognize and uphold Indigenous sovereignty. And given our usually modest uh, institutional positioning in most universities, uh, this means working with Indigenous communities to help build up community capacity um, and doing so in a way that respects their knowledge and their expertise and doing so in a way that doesn't begin with the assumption that we have all the answers, that we have a moratorium on appropriate knowledge, um, or that we know in advance what the appropriate theoretical or methodological tools um, should be required. Um, in other words, Indigenous studies includes Indigenous methodologies and includes Indigenous knowledges, but it's not limited by what seems to be held up as kind of exemplars of Indigenous methodologies. Uh, these days. And for many uh, of us who are working in Indigenous Studies, um, and more specifically in, Indig in, in Indigenous Studies units, um, and we tend to understand Indigenous knowledge as anything that helps Indigenous communities. And generally speaking, when we undertake research with Indigenous communities, it's the community that sets the uh, tone for kind of what the methodologies will uh, end up being. And if I had more time, I have a a story about uh, my own arrogance uh, as a junior professor uh, after having read uh, Linda Smith's book and presuming I knew what the appropriate uh, methodology methodologies would be for um, a community engagement project we were working on. Uh, 
So that's kind of the, the, the first part, which is uh, to kind of benefit Indigenous communities, uh, to uphold Indigenous sovereignty. Uh, and secondly, Indigenous studies isn't about or um, for Indigenous peoples or Indigenous students only. Indigenous studies is fundamentally relational. Uh, and insofar as that's true, uh, we of course want to ensure the excess of our uh, Indigenous students at both the undergrad and the, and the graduate level. Um, but we, will, we also want to spend part of our labor um, dedicating it to training non-Indigenous students about how, about how to act more ethically or more responsibly in engagement with Indigenous communities. It does us little good as an overall imperative to ensure that Indigenous stu students, particularly those connected to community, um, are properly trained because one of the sad but nevertheless revealing uh, features of colonialism uh, as it gets manifested in various places and certainly uh, where I live is that what mostly white people decide to care about can exert an enormous impact on the abilities of Indigenous peoples uh, to live our lives in relationship uh, to territory and to place in ethical and responsible ways. And one of the things that's been quite um, frustrating for us uh, at the University of Alberta and kind of Western Canada more generally is seeing the impact of Black Lives Matter in the United States uh, on uh, what's going on uh, regarding kind of Indigenous issues in Western Canada. Not in any way a critique of the amazing work that Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, movement sorry, Black Lives Matter movement leaders have done. It's just, it's deeply frustrating because we can never tell what white people are going to care about. And in the context of what I'm talking about here, we have indigenous women who are missing and murdered. We have indigenous men uh, who have been murdered just a couple of hours away uh, from where we live and has had basically no impact on kind of the everyday culture of the place, uh, but somebody uh, gets murdered thousands of miles away in the United States. And because of the way that kind of liberal racism works in Canada, this has uh, impacted the way that people think about anti-Indigenous racism as well. So kind of the right end, but the, the ethics to sort of get there uh, have been quite uh, interesting to, um, to watch. Regarding the second question uh, about what scholars located in the UK and Europe uh, can do to negotiate ethical imperatives of Indigenous studies, uh, it's pretty simple, although, as you probably will agree in a moment, uh, not easy. Uh, and it simply is to figure out how the work that you're engaging with, uh, training on, uh, working with, actually benefits Indigenous communities. A corollary uh, to that, and this is the really tricky part, is that you cannot, or at least you should not, decide what that means on your own. Um, what does it mean to attempt to engage with Indigenous communities or organizations that are thousands, in some cases, tens of thousands of miles away? Like I said, tricky, but tricky doesn't mean impossible. And as uh, Cole and others have demonstrated, there are complex and centuries old linkages uh, between Indigenous communities uh, today uh, spread across the world and uh, the UK, Europe. Uh, the, you know, the tentacles and the entanglements of empire uh, have, have ensured that that was and remains the case in my own family, for example, I had a, a great uncle that came over uh, to the UK during uh, World War I, uh, stayed here, got married, uh, had a kid, uh, that kid had a child. Uh, so I met a cousin who looks exactly like us, uh, but speaks with a very Bury St. Edmund uh, accent. And it's so fascinating to see the way in which she's reconnected with our community and our extended family over time. And there are lots of stories like that. And of course, there are also material culture stories uh, of various types of exhibits that exist in uh, museums across Europe with pieces that are related to uh, indigenous communities and indigenous peoples, again, spread all over the world. So tricky for sure, uh, but not impossible. Uh, and in case my own demotivational comments uh, weren't enough on their own, uh, I'll leave you uh, with one uh, final thing maybe to uh, mull over. Um, social justice uh, and anti-oppression advocates the world over uh, have argued that part of the labor that often gets entangled in uh, these efforts is managing kind of majority culture feelings. Don't make this about your feelings. Um, as critical whiteness scholar uh, Fiona Nichols wrote, probably uh, nearly 20 years ago now, uh, feeling guilt or feeling shame or whatever else you're feeling 
they're not helpful. They're not helpful to you as scholars, certainly, um, but they're not helpful um, to undertaking research that benefits Indigenous communities. Um, there are often actually emotions of privilege or luxury that uh, often result in people uh, who feel them turning away. Um, and that's not helpful for us and it's not helpful for our communities. And I'd like folks to walk away from this roundtable with a new or a renewed sense of public responsibility. What can I do to help Indigenous communities? How can I do this in a way that leads me to learning more, to learning better, to doing better, and to become a more ethical um, and responsible person in the process. Uh, Pushat Mishko, I will uh, end with that. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, thank you so much, all three of you. Um, there, there, are, there are three fairly different um, sets of thoughts for us, but, but lots of uh, points of intersection. Not, I'm hearing lots of things around kind of structures of, of intellectual frameworks, and, but also the structures of, of institutional frameworks. Um, and I think given that we started today with uh, a talk from Alistair Ponga Somerville, who, as everybody knows, is um, at a university that is currently uh, undergoing a, a very direct attack from its senior management on its indigenous faculty, that, that's clearly a very pressing issue. Um, so I think first, first off, I, w I wonder whether any of our three speakers wants to pick up on any of the, the comments that their, um, their co-panelists have made. It's like a seminar, isn't it? How long does one wait? Okay, so does anyone in the, in the audience uh, want, want to start with a particular challenge or a particular question? Okay, so I'll read Paul Portia's asked a question. She, Paul Portia is, um, is ill, um, but she asks whether the panel could speak to the difference between decolonization and anti-Eurocentric anti or anti-colonial interrogations of the colonial past, especially Eve Tuck and, and uh, K. Wayne Yang's point that an anti-colonial critique is not the same as a decolonizing framework. Well, I, I, I suppose I can, I can take a stab at this. Um, I think from the perspective of, and, and this was something that uh, Joey raised uh, uh, earlier in her uh, talk, which I thought was um, quite a perceptive point. Uh, I think sometimes it's important not to get caught up in kind of the terminology or the particular uh, nomenclature that we're, we're using. Whatever we want to kind of talk about um, as anti-colonial or kind of decolonization or indigenization for that matter, which is a term that we often use um, um, kind of in, in Canada. It's important to think about whatever we call that, what a move looks like from a point where people see uh, indigenous people as problems to be solved and a move toward understanding indigenous peoples as partners with good ideas of our own uh, to be engaged with. So whatever we call that, uh, the, 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 the terminology that gets used is less important to me um, than the kind of the, the ethical imperative that we're, that we're uh, moving toward. And I, I, I think um, perhaps as well in that, uh, in that context, it also becomes important to differentiate between the way that a term um, gets used in the academy, given its own kind of intellectual uh, and disciplinary genealogy, and the way in which it gets used kind of um, by those outside of the academy and those in community, because often those can kind of uh, bump heads uh, with each other um, as well. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, leave it there. Thank you, Chris. I might just add in, um, sorry, um, just, just the thought around the Eve Tuck Wang Yang point. Um, I think that one of the, um, major interventions that they offer us, and, and maybe, and, and to echo Chris's points as well about terminology, um, decolonization is circulating, at least in the United States, everybody is in the process of decolonizing. And often it's done without any inclusion of any, even an attempt of a land acknowledgement, let alone an understanding of indigenous presence and what that actually means in relationship to the decolonial effort. Um, so I think that, um, 
you know, I think that there's a way in which I'm, I'm just going back to the question about the difference between decolonization and anti Eurocentric or anti colonial interrogations. Um, I think, um, you know, we see this kind of manifest through social media with the emphasis on land back. Um, I think that that um, Eve Tuck and Wang Yang by telling us decolonization is not a metaphor that there is an actual um, ethical and political and um, historical um, drive behind it that's that's actually confronting um, and um, demanding a reimagination and a restructuring of the violences that have that have shaped our present. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Did, uh, did you want to add anything, Cole? No, I'm okay for now. Thank yeah, you. Okay. Does anyone in the audience want to come in on that question? Okay, so Laura says, uh, uh, I've got a question that speaks to Cole's points about recovering indigenous connections and presence in the UK slash Europe. So Laura. Yeah, um, I just, um, it's a very sort of simple and, and basic one um, to do with how you trace that presence. I mean, methodologically, you know, my research in this area has been grounded in text and textual representation. And of course you're dealing with a mediated colonial archive when you are finding traces of indigenous people who don't leave their own records of their experiences. Of course, many do, and it's fantastic when, when we do have those, but I'm, I'm talking specifically about examples where we don't have those. I mean, how do we avoid replicating the, the gaze of the, the, the colonial gaze when we're kind of, how do we avoid objectifying those peoples if we are not ourselves rooted enough in the particular philosophies of the um, communities those people come from in order to do a full a fully um, integrated or fully um, ethical um, indigenous studies approach those are great questions um, and they're certainly ones that I continue to wrestle with even having you know written a book that deals with this to some extent um, I, I think it depends on what our questions are in some ways um, and and what our subject of, of critical approach really is, if one of the things we're interested in is understanding, again, to use that phrase, the origin stories of empire, then, then it's not so much trying to, to f how do I say it, figure out what indigenous people are doing, but actually to turn that gaze back on um, the cultural practices and rituals of empire and so on, and to think about those equally critically um, and to think about those uh, uh, to think about those ethnographically as well um, and not just be focusing on trying to get at um, some sort of ethnographic truth about indigenous travelers or visitors yeah. um, I think that's a, an important piece to be thinking in kind of simultaneously um, multi-directional kinds of approaches I think that's really important so for me it was important to think not just about what are three Cherokee leaders doing in London in 1762, but what does William Hogarth have to say about his own cultural practices um, of, of empire and of representation. So trying to, to, to do both those things simultaneously is really important. And I also, I just want to flag one other, one other point that, that is something that I continue to struggle with um, that, that builds on some of the things that, that Chris has said in particular is, you know, making our work relevant and helpful for indigenous communities and working in sometimes in collaboration with indigenous communities more directly. And, and I still have an open question in my own practice about how to do that at large scales, um, how to tell big histories. And by big, I do not even remotely mean more important. I just mean big in terms of scale. Um, so for example, my book on London included about 40 different indigenous nations. How do we do that kind of large scale work in a way that's ethical given um, some of the things that we know are really important about connecting with indigenous communities and their own ways of telling their past, their own archives broadly defined and, and so on. So I'm still not sure what the answer to that question is. How do we do something that's more global in scale um, to set out some, some critical scaffolding for these large stories that then create space for more detailed and more um, community driven work to, to intersect with it. That's something that I'm still wrestling with um, to a large degree. Um, and I, I'm just not sure what the answer there is. So I'd be interested to hear what other people have to say as well. Thanks a lot. I, I wonder if I could follow that up with just a, a kind of, I guess a, a slightly similar 
a question to Jody that, that in, in respects is a, a bit of a provocation, but we're really fascinated by your description of where you see the, the, the most vital conversations uh, in Indigenous studies um, focusing. And in a sense, they, they sound to me like conversations that are uh, uh, very, spe very specific, very um, kind of epistemically bound, that, that in a sense are not conversations that European scholars at this point can necessarily engage in. And I suppose, so I suppose I'm asking that, that, uh, that, uh, that kind of, can, can they, right, can white, can white scholars contribute to those conversations productively? Um, and or how can they best, how can, how can those of us who are, who are working kind of tangentially to them best support that work, given it's, vital, given, given how vital it is? Sorry, David, was that a question you want me to start with? Yeah, sorry, Jodie, yeah, yeah, okay. sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, by raising Black Lives Matter and anti-blackness, I mean, anti-blackness is a structure, I think that, that here's where um, black feminists, um, it, it's, it's and, and, you know, work in racial capitalism uh, has shown us, is it's not just limited to the United States. Um, you know, structures of white supremacy are, um, you know, sourced in Europe, and, and there's exchanges across these things. So um, I, I do think that there's um, plenty of room for non-native um, and um, European scholars to be engaging in these kinds of questions. Um, and here's where I sort of, I'm, I'm, I, I really um, am grateful for and, and appreciate Chris's emphasis on um, the, the ways in which our work needs to help indigenous communities. And I think one of the challenges that we're seeing is that there's so many different ways that those, those what works and serves indigenous communities is defined by the local structures, right? So I, it raises questions for me as a Chickasaw scholar in the academy, if my work is to serve Chickasaw sovereignty, what, what, at what point do I have an ethical um, obligation to actually challenge Chickasaw sovereignty around um, its anti-blackness and exclusion of freedmen citizens? And so I, I think, you know, is that, is that a larger um, struggle that I should be doing? I, and I, I would say my answer is yes, as somebody who, um, whose ancestors were participated in slavery, who were slave owning Chickasaws, who structured the government in the 1890s and, 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 um, and, and during allotment to maintain anti-blackness, I think it's absolutely imperative that as a citizen of my nation, I advance Chickasaw sovereignty, sovereignty through challenging Chickasaw nations formations at this moment. And I think, um, it, and so, so I guess I invite, uh, I, here's where I think indigenous studies and um, settler colonial studies and both non-indigenous and indigenous scholars can actually help us amplify and hold the complexities of what stolen land, how stolen land um, has been um, used to build anti-black structures. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, so we have another question from Jody from Dan, for Jody from Dan. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, so I was really interest, interested in what you said about um, the inclusion of gender and sexuality in Indigenous studies, saying that they are, they are at the forefront of um, activism, but academia in a way is lagging behind. And I just wanted to ask you what kind of theoretical contributions you think um, queer, trans, and two-spirit indigenous scholars can make to the field and why this inclusion is vital? Sure. Um, thanks for the question. I think, you know, I think um, there's so many different ways that we see this emerging from the ontological for, um, for how, the, how we are um, seeing um, um, two-spirit and queer scholars stepping forward to give a, a, a broader understanding of um, family dy dynamics, understanding what relationality actually means, um, kind of um, interrupting or um, um, you know disturbing the ways in which we've understood um, um, kinship structures so there, so there's those elements I think that the, there's certain challenges that are needing to happen still and I think um, you know it's it I, I love work by Billy Ray Belcourt or um, um, a, a lot of the poets are doing this um, Leanne Simpson too right to try to really understand um, what is actually traditional what is kind of hoped for and um, what is um, um, and what is um, the lingering consequences of settler colonialism um, you know um, Christianity all these things that um, have produced homophobia um, and um, 
the sexism within our communities that have at times had other formations as well. I, but, the, but the risk here is sort of a romanticization of it. Um, you know, here I, you know, I think about what Leanne Simpson says, and as we have always done, there's a, there's a kind of constant understanding of indigenous communities have, uh, as ha having always achieved a kind of liberality um, that anticipates whatever it is that the current colonial present is kind of um, um, holding. So there's, there's, there's strange in, uh, in what we might call indigenous moves to innocence that might occur in this. Um, and so I think the work of the, the work of the indigenous queer is to constantly kind of um, push and under and um, reframe what we take to be normative, um, you know, and maybe even maybe in that here a push against um, Glenn Coulthard and what he calls grounded normativity. And I think maybe to add to what Jody said, I think, that, um, and I'll apologize in advance, Jody, because I might just be uh, saying the same thing you just said, uh, just not quite as smart. Um, I think one of the things that um, that um, kind of a, a queer focus has done is they've productively complicated the idea of the kinds of subject vectors that we take for granted when we're looking into things like identity. So, for example, one of the things uh, that they've done quite well is to productively complicate the difference between recognition by community and acceptance by community. And when we think about the idea of what it means to come from community, people often um, take that to mean accepted by community, but because of the various kinds of ways in which, well, you know, we're not just, we're not just, we don't just live in colonialism, colonialism lives in us. And the way that those kinds of things have impacted kind of people living in community as all of us, it's really important to think about kind of, you may know that so-and-so is somebody's uh, granddaughter or something like that without that person necessarily being accepted by the community because of the things that uh, Jody was just talking about. And I think um, queer studies in particular pushes that farther and does a more, again, productively complicated job of uh, laying those things bare than uh, anyone else who's working in, in Indigenous studies at the moment. Thank you. Um, so there are a few questions here that uh, specifically say they they are for the whole panel. So, um, Chiara, how about uh, your question first? Yeah, thanks. Um, now, I was just wondering, uh, some of the, you know, my question has already been answered in some ways by, uh, you know, different people in the panel, but uh, I would like to perhaps propose something, you know, complicated question a bit more. Talking about communities and working with communities, one of the issues for where scholars are removed um, and live far from, from the field, from, you know, those communities, how can we actually be ethical in our endeavours? And at the same time, you know, thinking about, I've been working with different people, but then there are obviously some tensions even within communities, within the elders um, obviously, and the younger generations, talking about the Black Lives Matter movement also. Something that came up was that the older generations have got a specific view of how to do activism in relation to um, indigenous lives, indigenous lives matter. And the younger generation has got a very different view of how to do it. And they pretty much um, approach and, and adopt the language of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, which is fine, but sometimes this creates frictions with, um, sorry about that, uh, frictions within the, you know, the members of the community and it's hard working from afar. Now I'm not in Australia anymore, I'm in the UK. How do I negotiate those tensions um, not being there? Does it make sense actually to do that kind of work being removed from, from the field and not having the funds to actually go to Australia and not being there physically? Um, also because, you know, if you are afar, you can only communicate via the internet, social media. Not every elder has got, you know, access to technological devices into, um, you know, technology in general. So how do you negotiate that? that does it make sense? Um, I'm, I'm wondering, or is there anything that you can, you know, help me with in, in trying to think about this issue um, in ethical terms? Thanks. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd say from my perspective, there's kind of two, two ways of thinking about this. Um, the one, as I, as I said, um, my comments are not uh, intended to uh, spark any kind of sort of uh, guilt or shame or what have you uh, in uh, any scholars that are undertaking uh, research that involves kind of indigenous texts or narratives or uh, what have you. Uh, people exist within all kinds of structural limitations that make actually connecting uh, sincerely with indigenous communities extremely difficult. Um, David and I have talked in the past uh, about 
um, what the possibilities might be like of um, kind of uh, creating almost something like a like a, um, an online portal where um, where communities can actually talk about things that would be good to get more research done on um, by people who say, for example, are in the in the UK or are um, are in Europe. Uh, it's like I said, it's tricky, and in some 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 cases, it feels almost impossible uh, to do. Um, and it's just if you are in a position where you can can do it, I would say it's better than uh, not doing it. If you are in a position where you can kind of connect with communities in an ongoing an ongoing manner, and you can kind of renew those connections, um, that's better than not doing that. If you are going to be uh, engaging in research um, that uh, Kind of includes or impacts or has included or impacted indigenous communities i would add too there's um if i can jump in um there's there's one other piece about i, I would say supporting indigenous um, activists and professionals and scholars who are already spending time in places like the uk and germany and so on um, particularly around questions of um, representation in museums, as well as issues of repatriation, but also ongoing issues of diplomacy. Um, and so I think there are actually possibilities there that we maybe don't um, either know about or take advantage of. Um, I just think about the conversations I've had with Indigenous activists and scholars in places like London, um, where people are traveling all the time, because that's the one of the the locuses really of, of colonialism. Um, and so there, I, I would encourage us not to be trapped in a, in a framework that sees again, indigeneity as bounded solely to particular places that if people are on the move all the time. Um, and so if there are ways that scholars working in the places that people are traveling to can um, support that work through their own research, through building institutional relationships um, and so on. Um, I, I think that's another sort of space where those kinds of relationships can be built. And again, as we've all said, it's that's not at all easy to do. And that may not be a priority for everybody involved in that conversation, but it's that's just another place to, to think about. Um, I might just jump in here as a way to kind of address um, Andrea's um, uh, question in the chat um, around Minneapolis and what I'm learning there. Um, because it, it gets back to the, the question of what it means to say indigenous lives matter um, in, in taking up BLM. Um, in Minneapolis, um, you know, um, at um, Little Earth, as I drove into the city this summer, um, still when the National Guard was there, there were signs at Little Earth. Um, on one side, it said Native Lives Matter. On the other, it said Black Lives Matter. And those two things could exist simultaneous, which I thought was really fascinating. And it wasn't seen as a competition, but instead a kind of an, an understanding of the fact that um, that um, Minneapolis is stolen Dakota land, that there's that, that all of the, the violences the police are enacting and have been enacting historically are tied to both the processes of, of Fort Snelling about um, the anti-blackness there and then um, the anti-indigenous violence that emerged as well. I think the thing that's um, so, sort of hard, it, the, the, the issues that are emerging are not just the ways in which George Floyd, the ways in which the city is wanting to reclaim George Floyd Square and turn it back into just a regular intersection at um, what, 38th and, um, um, gosh, what streets, what's the intersections? I'm going to blank on it at the moment. Um, just because I'm back in Illinois, um, but that um, there's there's an ongoing crisis that's happening there too. Chicago, thank you. <laughs> of course, it's Chicago. Um, yeah. Um, so so we have um, at the same time what's happening at um, you know Powderhorn um, at the Wall of Forgotten Natives, um, the unhoused community in Minneapolis. Is, there's an, a simultaneous sanctuary movement to create spaces and parks for people to be living, um, and then um, kind of um, at the beginning of this of um, and during. The, the protests for George Floyd with the with the like the with the National Guard coming in and then kind of the the um, the ways in which the um, police have been used to bulldoze and remove encampments um, and um, the the way how, how to hold the police violence and then the, the what to deal with the fact that many of the unhoused in Minneapolis are actually indigenous um, and some of them indigenous women who um, are facing um, 
um, sexualized violence and um, how, um, how to hold that complexity and um, refusal to kind of engage it at the same time. I think there's still more lessons to be had from Minneapolis, but the one hope that I, I carry is that there isn't necessarily a competition between the two, that the, the, at least within the activist communities, they're understanding that um, Black Lives Matter is happening on stolen land and that these things are, are related um, um, issues. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. I, I wonder if I could just add a, a sort of question to that, that that the other two might also want to speak to. Um, around the um, around one of Cole's points, um, but it's pertinent to what you've just said, Jody, about supporting activism, and and I'm thinking as well about the kinds of structural uh, um, frameworks around Indigenous studies that that you've each brought up in different ways as well and and the demands of the university in particular for us to do a certain kind of work that's arguably more even more restricted in the UK for those of us who work in areas like this um, and I wonder if you have any any thoughts about how whether whether you yourselves have faced challenges where the institutional demands of your university have, have prevented you from doing a particular kind of work or have made a particular kind of work significantly harder and in this instance the obvious one for us might be that however minded we are to, to involve ourselves in activism and, perf and performing advocacy if we don't produce articles and books uh, we're going to get in trouble when our research exercise framework comes around um, so, so you know there, there's always going to be that tension and I know it's not just feels like indigenous studies that, that have that tension but I, I wonder whether you have any thoughts about overcoming it. Well, I would say from the from um, our perspective, uh, one of the ways that that tension manifests itself is in the context of, and certainly this is not kind of um, specific to us, uh, is in the context of community engaged research. Um, and so, what are what are the imperatives of community engaged research? How do we, for example, differentiate between scholarship and service in the context of how we undertake uh, community engaged research? Um, how much, and pardon the expression, how much rope or leeway do you give somebody uh, to kind of build connections if say you've hired them from someplace else and they're coming into a new place. Um, I would say that our, our university has somewhat lagged on this, but in the last four or five years, there's been a real push among senior administration at the university to recognize the value of uh, community engagement. And then what are the kinds of um, specificities to community engaged research that we need to bear in mind in terms of um, publication rates and those kinds of things. And kind of one of the other things that we deal with a lot and we help uh, other units on campus deal with a lot at the University of Alberta is how to engage ethically with Indigenous communities in particular um, around things such as how do you negotiate an honorarium with an elder? Uh, what does it mean uh, when you want to give an elder an honorarium but um, that's going to get seen as taxable income and they don't want, like all of these kind of these tiny kinds of things that pop up all the time when you do it on a regular basis, but people who aren't normally engaged with it don't sort of think in that kind of, at that level of specificity, but it, it can be a giant pain in the ass if you do, and it can ruin relationships if you don't get it sorted out kind of in a good way at the beginning. I, I can hear the pain. Um, um, maybe I'll jump in just for a second. Um, it's, it's strange to think about institutionalization of Indigenous studies at Illinois. Um, you know, I, I think um, right now we're focusing on um, what's happening in New Zealand with um, Linda Tui Y. Smith and the attacks on Indigenous studies and Indigenous studies formations within academic institutions. Illinois um, went through one um, a few years ago um, and with the, with the substantive, um, you know, in, uh, um, delegitimizing of indigenous knowledges and indigenous uh, what, what might be indigenous studies when Stephen Salida was unhired or actually literally fired from um, a new job that he had taken here and and the consequence of that was a was was a sort of a demolishing by attrition uh, of what was what was a, pr a pretty um, significant American Indian studies program it's not that the institution is opposed to indigenous studies and there is still a formation here and it's attempting to kind of restart if possible um, but it does um, 
showed that um, I always took the lesson to be on, and you know, even even in the you know the intellectual modes and the political modes of what indigenous studies could be, kind of in the outward looking and critiques of colonialism, that to link um, ongoing settler colonialisms between the U.S. and Israel ended up being um, the, the 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 site at which the university was no longer enabled, no longer able to support the program um, when we were sort of doing their doing the uh, um, the trainings around diversity and inclusion and you know kind of confronting the mascots um, kind of seen as the the sort of um, you know we, we existed because they could have a mascot um, that was the kind of limited idea of what they allowed indigenous studies to do in the institutions I think the lesson I've learned is that we are it is always a fraught and um, challenging um, position to have uh, to do indigenous studies work in the academy when every aspect of um, legitimation um, um, you know, all the processes to which we are understood to be rigorous scholars, whether we're seen to be civil or uncivil, all of these things are already stacked so heavily against us and that um, at any point um, things can tip and we're removed. Thank you, Jody. Um, Carl, I don't know whether you want to add anything there. Um, I don't think so. I think I'll pass for now. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, so Holly May uh, has a question for the panel. So I couldn't find my mute button. Um, yeah, um, I mean, it's it's been mostly answered, actually, throughout a series of other questions. Um, basically, I was just wondering, um, based on what uh, Chris was saying about the kind of complete lack of impact that the BLM movement has had in his area on the kind of fight for indigenous rights, um, and since we heard this afternoon from uh, Chiara and Robbie um, about the beneficial impact that BLM has had on indigenous communities in Australia and has actually helped kind of highlight their issues alongside the BLM movement. Um, and I was just wondering, since that doesn't appear to have kind of transferred over to the area that you're in, Chris, I was wondering, um, Jodie and Cole, what your views on the matter were? How, do you think it's been beneficial near you or has it kind of had a non-impact? Sorry, folks, can I just jump in for a second? I, um, just to apologize, um, the Black Lives Matter movement has had a huge impact uh, in our, our area. It's indigenous activism that hasn't had any impact in our area on indigenous deaths. So it's it's the, something that has gone on from the states that has kind of come to our area and has been taken up kind of by uh, Black Lives Matter. That's had an enormous impact and they've done it very ethically. They're working with kind of indigenous uh, activists as well. So this is like Jody was talking about earlier, these things aren't in competition with each other and there is a solidarity. It's just interesting to see the extent to which non-indigenous people care about what's going on in the United States because in Canada, we always like to think about racism as something that happens someplace else. In fact, that's how Canadians often define racism. That's how you can see it, because it's something that's not happening in Canada. But when we see the things that go on on a day-to-day -day basis, right at our back door, it's got, it has no, it has seemingly has no impact on non-Indigenous people. Um, so sorry if I, if I confused that when I, when I spoke on it. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you for clarifying, I must have misunderstood. <laughs> Do you want, do you want um, Jodie or Cole to, to respond, Holly? No. The only thing I can say is that, and maybe maybe Cole can say more in relationship to sort of the attacks on um, statues as a way to understand history in, in North America. And as Confederate statues and statues of Columbus kept coming down this summer, I think, you know, there, there's a way in which the... Um, how settler society responds to, um, you know, any kinds of activist movements around, um, you know, BLM, you know, it, it, it is to kind of uh, address kind of, um, you know, surface level um, things, um, but, 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 and um, to not really, you know, in either way, um, either, <laughs> I mean, what, what was so stunning to me this summer in Minneapolis, too, is like, even though folks were calling, white activists were calling for police abol abolition, many of those same um, white activists were happy to have the police removing people from the, from the parks and from the encampments. And so, you know, it, it, the, 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 the sustainability of investment um, is sometimes um, 
the, the challenge as opposed to an actual um, commitment. Um, and so, um, so, so I guess I'm kind of I'm kind of going in two different directions. So on the one hand, there's a way in which um, settler society becoming aware of the perniciousness and constant kind of references to um, to um, settler colonial and, and anti-black violences through the statues and, and the remembrances um, and the willingness to pull those down and then the kind of surface level of that actually not um, addressing any of the actual violences that are ongoing for both black and indigenous li uh, lives, yeah. Thank you, Jody. Um, well, you, uh, you raised the specter of, of the Exeter Chiefs among other things. So I wondered if you yeah. want to expand on that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, sure. And Jody just mentioned um, the question of statues, and, and there's sort of been a running meme lately that, you know, how do historians function without their chisels, right? Because, of course, what we do as historians is we make statues. Somebody somehow thinks that that's what we do. And the thing that I've been trying to um, think about is our relationship to time and to temporality and, and chronology as we think about these kinds of spaces. And, and I think there were a couple of questions um, in the chat as well about primary sources and archives and that kind of thing. And so I want to kind of see if I can link these up a little bit. Um, it strikes me that in the debate about statues, whether it's Columbus or John A. MacDonald or, um, you know, the slaver in Bristol or whatever, um, people seem to be really preoccupied with the sort of the originary moment that these um, objects are supposed to represent. And I really am trying to encourage people in the broader public, my own students and so on, to actually think more critically about both the moments in which these objects are created. So whether it's the Jim Crow South or the, during the civil rights movement or whatever, um, and then also their valences today. And, and I guess this, this resonates for me with some of the questions about um, primary sources is that I think, I, I think sometimes when we try to work on these histories, we try to think of them in purely instrumental or in really quite, um, purely chronological kinds of ways. And one of the things that's been really important for me learning from indigenous studies is the kind of trans-temporal work that can be done that's also transdisciplinary. Um, so bringing contemporary poets into conversation with um, something that happened in 1642, or, or that's just an example. Um, and so to try to think about these as multi-temporal spaces, um, as palimpsestic kind of spaces, where it's not just about trying to quote get at a voice of an indigenous person in 1766, but to actually think about how does that experience in that moment resonate across various time scales. And I think that's the kind of conversation that can be happening around statues and other forms of commemoration as well, is to be thinking in both, both spatially and temporally at multiple scales simultaneously. And I think that's one way forward um, in, in terms of trying to quote get at um, lived experience in the deeper past. Um, and so I, I think these things are all kind of connected, or at least they're all pinging for me that way right now as, as I'm listening to everybody talk. Thank you, Carl. Um, okay, so Abdenour has a question for the panel. Is he still there, Michael? Um, he's not coming on, but he's written his question in, so maybe you can read it out. I, I can read it out, um, I think. Uh, what are the ethical aspects to take into account when pursuing a trans-indigenous -indig study of literary texts from different indigenous literary traditions? And is it ethical uh, to connect, I guess, such studies to other global issues such as capitalism and modernity? Um, that's a fairly theoretical question. I, w I wonder, Jodie, um, whether you have thoughts on that, first off. Thinking, thinking about, I guess, thinking particularly about that, that mm -hmm. you know, well, I'm just thinking about literary study and, and, and it's kind of just, I mean, this, this is a question, I guess, that surfaced several times today mm -hmm. about that tension, and this is for all three of you, that tension between the specificity demanded of, uh, you know, uh, studies that that draw on philosophical and, and cultural traditions and then the idea of the transnational in indigenous studies or settler colonial studies the idea of the trans indigenous so just trying to hold like a, a Chad Al, a Chadwick Allen's um, definition of the trans indigenous um, as um, as and 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 
it's been a little bit since I've worked with his text and arguments and how it is that he sets up the, the possibility for something alternative to comparative, right? Always looking for something compar uh, non-comparative, but as a way to drive kind of what the local, um, how there might be conversations across local struggles that can meet in order to address um, larger structures again. It's always, you know, this, the structural form, um, formations, I, I think is a really useful way to think about this. Um, on the, um, but in thinking about that, you know, it's also like, what does it mean to, to think about transnationalism in indigenous studies, right? We, I mean, th this is the thing that is, I think, hard to drive home for, at least for, for folks that aren't, you know, maybe aware of um, indigenous I mean, communities, the, the, the diversity of what can be called indigenous, the, the contests over it. Um, these definitions are in flux, I think, as, as I've maybe gotten a hint of from the conversations today. Um, yeah. and, 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 it, and they're not always spatialized the same way, and they don't mean the same thing to the same communities or even to um, different communities that are, are now kind of forced into proximity. So in the United States, I mean, trying to hold who indigenous peoples are when you have global indigeneity coming into these lands, and then holding who the indigenous peoples are in those, in those you know, performative land acknowledgements um, and how to understand those stakes, I think is, I think, I think it's, it's adding a complexity that um, both speaks to how important it is to do trans ind indigenous or transnational indigenous studies, but, but, has, but potentially sort of gives, gives a sense of what's cloudy, clouding or muddying the conversations, um, you know, and, and then throw into that, you know, work from, you um, um, Robin Kelly and others who are like very clearly telling us that, you know, there's a way in which how we've theorized indigeneity in North America already forecloses blackness. We can't hold the possibility of black and indigenous in these conversations either. So I think the ethical imperatives um, are really constantly reminding us to hold the specificities that what matters in some communities are not necessarily going to translate over or I'm already using translation, are not going to always be um, the same. Um, and, and obviously, the definitional works that we're, we're doing are not necessarily going to hold. So the, it's all, the ethical is always down to the specifics, I think. Thank you. Um, Chris, I wonder if you have thoughts, um, either in relation to Indigenous studies broadly, but, but also the application of the transnational to, or the, tra the trans-Indigenous to the the specific work that you do or, and have done since your PhD? Well, I'll, I'll say briefly, uh, again, probably not quite as smart as Jody. Um, one of the things that uh, I uh, read recently that really stuck with me was um, the piece that uh, Alice Tapunga Somerville uh, wrote in the Indigenous Sources and Methods uh, text talking about the idea of, um, of uh, a sea of islands and talking about the ways in which we often see presences and absences when we can actually kind of flip those to see presences in all these different kinds of uh, places. And certainly my family and many other families uh, kind of as Indigenous families circulate much more than the literature gives us, uh, gives us credit for in terms of the way that we kind of narrate what Indigeneity is kind of related to place. Uh, and especially in the post-World War II period when I think about kind of uh, people from my uncle's generation, the amount of traveling they did for, you know, various reasons relating to kind of like this, um, this vigorous masculinity that's coming out of Western Canada in the post-war period. I think there's a lot of room to do uh, work in this area that sort of uh, begins with that kind of uh, transnational and trans-Indigenous um, synergy uh, and also um, uh, just the way that they can rub up against each other as well. Thank you, Chris. Um, th there's actually another question at the end of the chat, Cole, that, that addresses this specifically in relation to history, um, where Ananya asks whether um, you have any thoughts about methodologies for writing transnational histories. Um, so I wonder whether you might want to um, approach it from that angle. Sure, I could. I, I guess I could say something about that. I, I think. I think. Um, hmm. One of the things that I'd want to think about there is, again, the spatiality of the transness of it. Um, and I think something that maybe was being gestured toward a little bit earlier, and, and I, think, um, I think maybe Jody's comments, is where is, our, where is the imagined center? And I think this also relates to what, what Chris was just saying about absence and presence. And, you know, I, was, I really struggled with my work on London to, about the sort of centrifugal versus centripetal forces um, and the relationship between the so-called metropole and the so-called periphery and so on. And so I think whenever we're doing those, um, 
those transnational or sort of large scale kinds of projects, we have to really be thinking about how we're framing our center or the center of the story and where that center actually is. Um, that, that London is a periphery as well as a center. It's a periphery to Métis territory. It's a periphery to Coast Salish territory and, and so on. Um, so there's that, but I also, um, I, I find in my own work, I, the national um, sort of gets lost a little bit. I, I tend to oscillate between the global and the really much more intimate. And I sort of lose that, that middle space because I'm really thinking about places more than nations in my work. And there may be some real problems with doing it that way, particularly around indigenous sovereignty and nationhood. And I, I wouldn't say that I'm leaving those out, but um, it really has to do with where we think the, the lines of power are converging um, and to really try to write against the just so stories of, of where those lines of power really are um, and to look at the ways in which um, indigenous presence in a place like London or Hamburg or wherever really destabilizes all of these, these what are ultimately teleological categories that refer back to these kinds of processional um, you know, civilization to savagery metaphors that, that are still operative in so many ways. So I think, you know, doing transnational approaches, I think we're still in a place where we, we're still learning what that even could be. Um, and that's, that's the thing I always try to remember is this is a very much a, a process and, and that's in progress right now, um, that a lot of these conversations that we're having while Indigenous studies is a much older discipline than most people give it credit for being. Um, many of these conversations are still just emergent in many ways. And so I, that's why conversations like this one are, are so important, I think. Thank you so much. Okay, well, we're working you hard, but we're, we're getting towards the end of our questions. Um, so uh, Judith, would you like to come in with yours? Um, thank you, David. And in fact, uh, I thought that my question, the one that I put in the chat box might be, I uh, might uh, mean a little detour. And I just like to add to Cole's um, note on, um, on um, your call for reclaiming um, or for, for um, analyzing contemporary um, literary pieces, for instance, that relate to the past for instance, um, um, that, that enter this conversation with the moment when a colonial moment of creation of a stat statute, for instance. And so uh, a couple of uh, examples came to my mind, such as uh, Rufo, Canadian uh, poet's work on Grey Owl, and also uh, George Bowering's Burning Water, Wiesner and Dirt Rick's work on, um, on um, uh, the Columbus novels. But my, my question, was really related to your view, everybody, all the panelists' view on mixed heritage writing and how a European scholarly approach, in your view, could be ethical and uh, proper to um, mixed heritage, especially uh, when we mean um, Euro-American and indigenous mix in the family line. Well, I, I mean, I suppose I would say that I, I, um, I tend to, at least in my kind of 20 years of scholarship, I've tended to uh, shy away from using terminology around kind of mixedness because generally I find it, and I'm, I, don't, I don't know your work and I'm certainly uh, not criticizing you, but I find it a lazy way of kind of thinking more complexly about the kind of lived relationships that people actually actually have. If by mixed people mean someone who has one Indigenous parent, one non-Indigenous parent that didn't grow up in community, that's a much different situation than someone with mixed parentage, for example, who did grow up in community. If by mixed and non-mixed they mean someone who is looking for a darkie in the woodpile of the archives from 400 years ago, that's a different, um, a different context. And so I tend to sort of I try and move away from kind of the, the racialized uh, emphasis to start thinking about what the actual uh, lived connections for people are. So I don't, it's not a very useful, useful answer. Actually, I'll jump in to say, I think that was actually an incredibly useful answer. Um, um, in, in part because um, in, trying to think about and holding the European um, 
I, I, I don't even, it, 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 doesn't almost, it doesn't make sense within um, indigenous kinship or even within, you know, understanding, um, at least in, in North America and the Southeast, where there's lots of intermarriage, um, uh, that these, the, the intermarriage, I mean, there's no, like blood quantum is something that's introduced. Um, um, citizenship requirements are, are always um, serving a certain, you know, ma maintenance and, head and, and, and formation of whiteness. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what it means to emphasize, you know, assimilative, assimilative practices. I, I mean, as, as cultures and as peoples, we've been navigating, and for, for Chickasaws since, since, you know, the 1560s or whatever, um, with, you know, from DeSoto, the French, the British, the Americans, we've had iterations of this. Um, and so the, I guess the ethical is kind of what's the investment in understanding or identifying um, and, um, you know, the other side of it is like, what is, how, um, how is, um, you know, indigenous survival adaptive and part of a process that's ongoing as, and, and um, you know, imagining, um, you know, additive as opposed to sub subtractive formations of, of creativity. David, okay. I think you could probably speak to this as well. <laughs> uh. It's, I, I'm not going to take the stage from you guys, but um, hey, Cole, is there, do, do you want to add to that? Uh, no, I'm all right. Thank you. Um, so there is a, just a follow-up question from Ananya from the last one that you answered, if, if we could just throw that one in here now. So Ananya. Hi, uh, sorry. Um, uh, thank you so much to the panelists. Uh, this has been absolutely wonderful. Cole, uh, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question. Um, to the methodology. Um, so basically, oh, by the way, I have a signed copy of yours from Berkeley. It seems surreal that we are in a lockdown now. Um, so your work, Penny Van Toon, and I think Lisa Brooks, when uh, you write about uh, history of a place, you do employ a lot of um, literatures, like literatures coming from um, oral poetry, um, and literal evidence that has been passed through oral narratives. Um, and what I wanted to ask is, uh, is there um, a way of productive reading when we do metaphorical readings of the same literatures for building um, histories of a place? Uh, and I want to relate it to the idea that to, today Alice uh, brought in, like, you know, making uh, the history of genealogies because metaphorical readings often of these texts lead us to find out new relationships between um, indigenous communities and indigenous people who might have traveled to a place. Uh, but the problem that exists in institutions is that uh, they demand a more rigorous historical analysis, which does not really support metaphorical reading of literary texts. So like, um, some, like in a summary, I wanted to ask is how much of a literary reading of these texts would you do to build transnational histories of a place, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, no, those are great questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to be pretty omnivorous in my approaches. I, I think, you know, there, I, I've heard from, including from people who trained me, that there are always reasons not to do things when it comes to indigenous history. There, you know, it's, we can't know if oral tradition has changed or we can't, you know, there are all these reasons we can't do these things. And I think the work of people like Lisa Brooks in particular, um, our beloved kin is a great example of, you know, really honestly and forthrightly using technology, or not technologies, methodologies of um, creative nonfiction and actually straight up fiction um, to, to sort of flesh out these moments that the colonial archive, or even in some cases, the, the oral tradition um, or, or other forms of knowledge keeping um, simply don't provide us. And so I'm always looking for reasons to do things rather than not to do things. And I think historians have often, um, or history as a discipline has often taken the most conservative and the most, to use uh, Jody's term, subtractive approach to writing about the past. Um, and so what I think I see happening though among a younger generation of historians is a willingness and a commitment to moving beyond those disciplinary obsessions with so-called rigor or neutrality or objectivity um, to actually try to do some other kinds of work um, that's more expansive and more um, 
I'm not interested particularly in, in the fetishization of accuracy or the real story or, or, or all of that, but I think that gets us to a more well, well-rounded sense of, of the possibilities of the connections between the past um, and the present. And so one of the things that I think we need to be doing professionally is really supporting and amplifying the work of those younger scholars, both in our disciplines as well as, as beyond them, um, and really make sure that they're not um, feeling um, left out in the cold because of some disciplinary bias towards something called rigor, um, when in fact we know there are all kinds of different rigor. And one of those kinds of rigor can be reading transtemporally as well as transpatially um, in these kind of um, associative, constellated, rhizomatic sorts of ways that I think are, are much more fruitful approaches than saying, here's why we can't use this source. So I, I try to have a more open, open approach to that. Thank you very much, Cole. Um, Thank you. There, we're, we're at two minutes to seven. I'm very conscious that you guys have all worked really hard, but also that there are people who are going to be coming back for the films at 7.30 who might need to get something to eat. So um, I think there is one outstanding question in the chat, but maybe, maybe you guys could have a little look at that before you leave and, and see if you have any particular answers for it. This is um, Cowrie's question about language. So just before we leave, and in lieu of um, my, my absolute in inability to summarize this conversation, it's been so rich and, and interesting. I wonder instead whether I might ask each of you for a quick recommendation of something that, that's been published recently that you think is, uh, is really essential reading for us. <laughs> There's been too much published recently. <laughs> <laughs> I will just say, I just finished reading The Night Watchman by Louise Erdrich and I'm teaching it in my class. And it's, it's strange to do that as a novel, um, but I find it to be an incredibly, um, you know, it, maybe because it's in Minneapolis, maybe because it's also engaging in um, missing and murdered, um, uh, sex trafficking of Native women, tying it all, it, it gets to the questions of, of, of the grounded historicity and how we hold realism and imaginative fiction together in narrative formation. So we, yeah, that's, that's the thing I've been reading most recently. Amazing. Thank you, JD. Um, I'll, I'll just make a, a plug for a book that I've just started, which is The Black Shoals um, by Tiffany Latabo King, which is really thinking about the intersections, the potential at potentialities of intersection between Black studies and Indigenous studies. And as a white scholar, this is something I need to um, understand and to um, figure out how to amplify without getting in the way of and and so on and so that's a book that I think is going to have a really important impact and it's not just because I'm thinking of maritime metaphors a lot lately with my new work but um, I think it's going to be a really um, impactful book. Sorry say the name of it again Cole I just missed it. It's called The Black Shoals S-H-O-A-L-S by Tiffany Latabo King. Cheers thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Cole. And I would say probably either um, the Critical Indigenous Studies collection by uh, Aileen Morton Robinson, which is a couple of years old now, I would, which is great, uh, or also um, Sources and Methods in Indigenous Studies. And certainly I'm not saying that because I'm a co-editor of it, because we did very, very little co-editing. The people we got to uh, contribute to were just amazing. And it's, a, it's just a giant wealth of uh, discussion on methodologies relating to Indigenous Studies. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you again to all three of you. Um, this, this has been really, really interesting and you leave us with so many things to, to chew over and, uh, and to consider in relation to our own work, in relation to the way we approach the work of others. Um, so thank you. Thank everybody in the audience for, um, for listening in, joining in, asking questions. Um, uh, it's been a really fascinating day today. And as I say, 7.30, I believe, uh, in this same Zoom room, um, there will be the session uh, of uh, short films by Indigenous filmmakers. Thank you very much, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care.